no. and and also a hope, and a hope a friend and um, um, and somebody that 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 I certainly look up to um, still. Um, the so I'm going to read a funny thing here, sort of funny. Um, the uh, Raymond w was. Uh, well, born in Austria, but hello, hello, but educated in Austria, uh, and in fact uh, did some real work in Austria, uh, houses and parts of cities, and the man draws. Also, he was involved in groundbreaking at that time experimental computer programming, leading to a, a program not so well known called H A N D. Tradition of Austrian architects. Bail out to the U.S. Schindler, Neutra, Abraham, Mack, Coop Himmelblau. Early 60s, and the man draws. Became part of the group that influenced American and really world architecture in the late 60s and 70s through teaching and through theoretical work. And Raymond will, will correct me on most of this. Uh, Eisenman, Graves, Seligman, Meyer, Haydick, and others. through their teaching and theoretical work, and the man draws. Became a mainstay at Cooper Union, perhaps the most influential school of architecture during and after the Yale collapse. Um, Yale equaled stars, Cooper equaled drawings and making with theory, and the man draws. The Cooper triumvirate, Haydick, Eisenman, Abraham, and you'll correct me on this one, Along, along with um, Meyer, Williams, Scafidio, and others that I'm not aware of. Um, we can't underestimate the influence of these three educator, designer, architects. And the man draws. Theoretical work, linear city, metropolitan core, mega bridges, air ocean city, universal city, Transplantation One, Radar Cities, Urban Interchange, Continuous Building, Moon Crater City, Earth Cloud uh, Hoist, House with Curtains, House with Two Halves, House with Nine Rooms, House with Permanent Shadow, House with Three Rooms, House with Paths, House with Three Walls, House with Two Horizons, House with Flower Walls, House Without Rooms, Seven Gates to Eden, House with Projected Landscapes, House, and then Projects, leading to the spectacular New York Tower, the Austrian Cultural Forum, and the man draws. And finally, cooking, oops. Mexico and China. And the man draws. <laughs> and the man draws. <laughs> and finally, a gift from all of us for his inspiration and influence. Um, and we want to welcome Raymond to the table. Thank you. The mic? No, I don't need the game anymore. Okay. <laughs> so if you just put the first. I have to admit, it's my first power, PowerPoint uh, presentation, so I'm a little nervous if I can operate the machine. Me too. I think we'll get together. Yeah, just put this one on, and then I just do this too. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's fine. But this is not the next one. What is that? This is not the next one. I'm getting nervous. You have to go to the... Alexis, could you help me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the next one is the right one? Yeah, next one. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, <coughs> I must admit I feel a little deflated tonight. Uh, Boston is leading the Yankees by 8 to 1. And... Uh, and uh, uh, I was actually expecting Eric to be here tonight because, as you probably have guessed from my, uh, the title of my talk, uh, true is rhyming uh, new. And so maybe in anticipation of his absence, I, uh, if you wonder who the two guys are there, this is Eric and myself in disguise before we enter the debate about new and true. When I, I was sitting here three years ago, I think it was, first time I came to SIAC, and um, I remember being driven out in the parking lot and I saw the first time this building, I was absolutely mesmerized. I could sense a complete new school. I was teaching at Cooper at a very wonderful but very incestuous place. And when I entered that building, I felt more or less liberated because I was confronted with a truly new school. And I think that newness was not imposed by the program or by the work actually produced in here, but by that radical challenge of that linear building uh, with the program of a school of architecture. And then, when I started teaching here, this feeling was even at hand, because it was not a coherent school. And I believe, in our time, there should not be a coherent school anymore. And that was also the problem with Cooper. I mean, when I arrived here, I have given up my tenure after 30 years, after I had watched Tony Wiedler to destroy the school within one year, or at least one could sense the latent destruction of the school. And so I just want to say I'm very happy that I'm back here. Uh, in a funny way, when you teach at a place and then you give a lecture at the same place, you feel like you are standing up on a pedestal so you are be seen and heard better. Uh, because I ultimately have not much more to say than what I what I am telling the students during my my teaching. So when I read that, that sort of the credo of the school, Eric made this this uh, uh, little uh, poems about make it new. Uh, I didn't think much about it. It was sort of like it was in a way supporting the spirit I felt in this place. Until he gave a lecture in New York, that was, I don't know, a few months ago. And uh, he showed a very powerful, seductive image of a Chinese calligraphy uh, with a statement of an emperor, I don't know, 1000 BC, who uh, claimed to make things new. I forgot exactly what the three tools were, the sword, the hammer, and the axe, or whatever the, the three things were. And uh, that's the first time I started really to think about what that new meant. I knew what it meant for Eric, but I wasn't so sure what it meant for the emperor. And I thought that it might me mean for the emperor not to make a new sword, a new hammer, a new axe but rather reinvent those tools, reinvent their essence. So as I believe the newness of our time, the real newness, not the shale newness of all the fashions we are witnessing today, is really reinventing the agents. And, and uh, so the true in my, my, what I try to do tonight is not to 
to somehow uh, give you an answer or define what true and what new is, but rather show it to my work. And, uh, and uh, I never, in my entire life, my architectural life, I was never aware how new my things were, except for myself. I read recently in the new Bobby Dylan, in the autobiography, the first volume, he said, <coughs> you don't wake up in the morning and make an attempt to write a new song. It is rather that you have to feel the need to convert something of something that has not been there yet. So that newness cannot come from the outside. It cannot be that what the public decides what is new. They, de they, de they decide what the fashions are. But it has to come from the inside. So everyone, every student, every architect has to realize uh, their own limits in their own work and measure. See, I'm, I'm uh, I would say, I'm primarily a laborer. Uh, I learned that from my father, who was a winemaker. I'm a laborer, and I'm a dreamer. And I think dreams can be extremely precise, and labor is necessary to implement them. So for me to define for myself what is new is how well I resolve a problem. Without stating a problem, this, that is for teaching exactly the same. If you don't define a problem well, you cannot teach. So for me, teaching and working is absolutely synonymous. There's no difference. With the exception that in teaching, I simply try to inspire and being inspired and demand precision. I think Valerie said, uh, what is more mysterious than clarity? And that's really what I'm after, about clarity. So I will show tonight in, in my own work uh, how I try to resolve problems. Actually, it reminds me, you know, in other disciplines, it's so much easier to define uh, how a problem can be really resolved. I remember in uh, my last year of high school, uh, my math teacher, whom I hated because he was after my girlfriend, <laughs> and uh, he, um, it took him a full, a full blackboard, a large blackboard, to resolve an equation. And I went home and I said, there's something wrong, cannot be, there must be, there must be a better solution. And I came up with a solution which was one line. And of course, it was an incredible triumph to, to uh, humiliate my math teacher. But it was much more a satisfaction for myself that I was able, within the discipline of mathematics, to resolve that problem. And ultimately, I believe that to make architecture is not that much different from cooking or winemaking or shoemaking or tailoring. It's just each discipline has different complexities in terms of how you can contribute to the world or to the society. <coughs> I mean, I push the button, but nothing happens. <laughs> Alexis, help me. <laughs> I mean, I like those two guys, but nevertheless. I thought I only had to push a button and the thing would work. Okay, here we go. So from now on it goes? Yeah, it or you have to Just come here every time? Uh, I might have to, but I think oh, it's then fine. Then it's really, then it's not so good. No, it should be fine. Okay, good. thanks. So <coughs> I want to start just with what I call certain phenomena, which are for me essential how to make architecture. Now, one is drawing. And uh, as Robert has mentioned all the time, the man draws. I still do. Um, I think Fernando Pessoa said once, we need an art that is one-dimensional. So it didn't mean that manifestations of art should be one-dimensional, but one should be able to reduce in any discipline uh, the, the manifestation to 
dot zero. I mean that when you draw, actually, you draw a p you, when you when the pencil makes the line, you actually uh, state the theorem of geometry that a point makes the line. But also when you draw, I mean these are two uh, images, probably not that uh, it's subtle the difference between a computer line which I, I think it's not a line, it's a picture of a line, an image of a line. And the drawn line, it's like a seismograph. It uh, reflects all your anxieties, all your desires, all what you want to do through a simple movement of a pencil. And so for me, I'm always fully aware if I draw with a soft pencil on a hard paper or vice versa, until finally you can actually use a 9H and if you don't use the right paper for the 9H, the lead cuts the paper. So drawing is not uh, applying something. It is like, uh, oh, that's my cell phone. <laughs> I'm, s I'm sorry. You know, the new cell phones have such horrible, uh, sorry about that. Um, where was I? That it's actually engraving. I mean, it, a design uh, has its etymological root in secare, in cutting. As ultimately, for me, when I draw a line, I anticipate. When I draw then more complex uh, constructs, uh, I anticipate uh, the confrontation with uh, material, with texture, with color, and with gravity. So that is one of the most, I think, for me, essential beliefs that you cannot really design with a computer unless, and this is not computer bashing, I mean I use computers, not I personally, but we, we have to, uh, but it is, uh, the, there is a, a, some a neurologist wrote a book that's called The Hand, and in this book uh, he puts forward a rather convincing theory that it was not the brain that developed the abilities of the hand, but that the hand affected the evolution of the brain. So somehow, if you, ref if you, s if you uh, rely on a machine that completely detaches you from, I mean, from touch, from the power of your hand, you give up one of your most precious abilities. So, Then, the other phenomena which I always uh, cherished as an influence was film. That's a film uh, my friend Peter Kubelka made in the 60s, it's called the Rainer film, where, which I believe is the most seminal film ever made, because it consists of the four basic elements of cinema, that is, the white frame, that means the transparent frame where light can pass through, and the obscure, the black one which obscures light, and then silence and sound. So in this film, we made like a symphony of, uh, of uh, a collision of those frames. And the film only lasts, I think, two minutes, but through the dissection of time, uh, you get completely, you, you lose your the illus illusionary sense, what I call illusionary sense of measurable time. It's the time the film produces, so as time architecture produces. And also, uh, I was lucky to, you know, to, to meet Kubelka, through him I met, then when I came to America, all uh, American filmmakers, from Brackett to Jonas Makers, and they were not only sort of inspiring me in terms of their work, but in terms that it was possible to, with one camera, to be the director, the cameraman, the sound man, whatever, you know, the 200 people you, you can read after a Hollywood movie, uh, were all uh, condensed to one man. And so it was for me almost like the equivalent that you can make architecture, and I say that to my students repeatedly, to make architecture, you only need a pencil, a piece of paper, and your desire to make architecture. 
then uh, another phenomena in, in film, as we all know now, we all have seen Matrix and all uh, other digital uh, illusionary films where everything seems to be possible. Now, people are flying through the air, gravity doesn't seem to exist anymore. Or in the, in the beginning of, of, of that uh, sort of creating a tectonic illusion, uh, this is a photograph of, uh, of uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, where they actually built the model, which then led to the uh, scenes of the movie. And the interesting thing is that despite the fact there is an incredible, powerful, mysterious change of scale, you still can sense the origins of that space, that it was actually built, it built as a small model which is a tool to project the actual image, the actual spaces, the cinematographic space, which is not an illusionary space, it's a space of its own uh, uh, autonomy and, and origins. In terms of uh, my own uh, sort of uh, tectonic or syntax, uh, I have tried so all my work to uh, uh, confront uh, basically three issues. One is that architecture, if you like it not, is a violation of the site. So while the site, the ontological site, is a collision of the sky with the earth and the horizon, is this magic line which neither belongs to the sky nor to the earth. And anything you do in architecture is a violation of that ontological side. So either you dig a hole in the ground, you make a mound, or ultimately then to create in that anonymity of tectonic landscape a place, a place which then would reflect a program, a program of sacrifice, a program of solitude. And this is maybe something, and then of course it then the, the uh, immediacy of collision of either the body with phys physiological space or object with object. Now, the question arises more and more when you look at the spectac spectacles and spectacular contribution to architecture in our time. Uh, that means that there are edifices created which are in its momentary presence spectacular. But then, after a while, even after one month or two months, the spectacle starts to fade, and you, you are confronted with a rather date that you know already that it, as fast as it was produced by the, I call them shape makers. The, the, the famous architects of our times are shape makers. They, they, are, they do, do not construct uh, the architecture from the one-dimensional space of the point and the line but they make shapes, spectacular shapes. So the question now arises, what is the role of architecture in our time? Is it to celebrate uh, the more or less chaotic and unpredictable notion of human activity? Uh, or to uh, recall the actual tragic dimension of our life, that we are born and we are going to die. And architecture, I mean, Lowe's said it very beautifully, when you walk through the woods and you uh, encounter a hole in the ground which is three feet wide and six foot long, you know that's architecture. So that means uh, the programs uh, have more or less disappeared from architecture. When you take the most prominent program now, which, uh, which is, I mean, there's, there are more museums now in the world than, than, than real art. But those museums are simply celebrating the spectacle of display. Uh, if you take, for example, seminal contribution to the program of museum, if you recall Le Corbusier's uh, Square Spiral Museum, which was a complete new idea about how to view art, or you take then the, the the Guggenheim, uh, was a complete new program of how to approach and perceive art. When you look at Frank's, uh, the most celebrated museum of our time, uh, look at the plan, I mean, not uh, talking about the 
spectacular architecture. The plan does not confront at all the program of museum. Museum etymologically has been called a room for study. That means, uh, particularly in the Chinese culture, the, the nothing was on display uh, permanently. Uh, uh, paintings were brought into the room, unfolded, put on the wall, contemplated, studied, and put back into storage. So I think unless we, we regain a sense of program, that we, but I'm not saying, you see, I said it many times before, it's neither form follows function or function follows form. It's a confrontation with the program. I mean, architecture has the power to be absurd. Architecture has the power to deny access, to deny illumination, but it has to confront access and it has to confront illumination. So now I'm just showing. Uh, okay. Um, just few few images of showing more or less my, which uh, Robert already has more or less anticipated. Um, my work from the from the uh, very beginning when I really started. I mean, at that time I made some little houses in Austria, which are not really that significant. They're not that bad either. But uh, it was really when I started to make this these projects of, of uh, cities, uh, projects which are were autonomous, which were detached from, from any uh, client or any kind of professional context, I felt that was the moment when I liberated myself from becoming a professional architect. And I'm not a professional architect. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I celebrate the discipline of architecture, if I build or if I draw, and for me there's no difference. So these are, uh, but those uh, few projects from the 60s are deeply rooted in my conviction of interference with the site. So this is a, you know, I call it the glacier, glacier city, or uh, the, the uh, universal city which actually encircled the whole earth. So I created my own landscape of horizontal skyscrapers to form a valley uh, and, and uh, more or less became its own site, not unsimilar to to, um, to the project I'm doing in China, which I'm going to show later. What for me was very peculiar, that at the same time when I did those projects in the 60s, um, I did a book on uh, indigenous architecture uh, in the Alps where I grew up. And I became, when I finished studying architecture, I became first time aware about the power uh, of the of of those uh, structures, and uh, through the, a friend of mine, a photographer, we made that book, and uh, and it was for me very curious because it was just it seemingly a complete opposite. On one hand, with the so-called visionary project, and this have was more or less uh, the anachronism of going back to uh, to my to my past and simply recording what I all of a sudden saw with new eyes. But uh, two years ago, the Architecture Center in Vienna decided to republish the book. This book was published in 1963, and it was republished. And for me, it was sort of, uh, I felt uneasy about it. Unless I saw the book again, and I was so happy because it was as new as it was 40 years ago. Because there was a certain honesty on my part about simply, I didn't try to make an architecture book. I simply tried to record, also with the magnificent uh, ability of my photographer friend, uh, to record those images. And, they, and maybe that confrontation between, uh, almost like schizophrenic confrontation, between the, the visionary project I did at that time and, 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 the, and that book, uh, led then maybe and that is, of course, all speculative. I, when I talk about the past of my work, I become a speculator. See, when I work, I try to eliminate speculation. So, that's in, also when I, you know, give a talk, I'm, it's more or less I'm detached from my work. I could say it, it, what I say has nothing to do with my work because the work is autonomous. So this uh, uh, now led. Uh, it's not quite sequential, but to a whole series of, of houses where I tried to challenge 
really the, maybe the oldest, the oldest and most challenging program in architecture. It's the, the place, the house was the program where in the old house you were born, you were educated there, you, were, uh, you got sick, you were healed and you died. And so I tried to create, uh, how this is a house without rooms, that's more or less better inhabited, becomes like a fossil of its own, uh, of its own space. And then more elaborate uh, series of houses where I simply took a very uh, basic tectonic themes to define the character of the house. House with curtains, house with flower walls, house with two horizons. House with path, house with permanent shadow, house with three walls. House with, this was not path, I forgot how this house was called, but it was kind of interesting where the, the road folds, folds over. Uh, house with permanent shadow, house with three rooms. <coughs> and then to, to uh, I returned a few years ago to a whole series of drawings which I called uh, uh, Lotsi Ultimi, the, the last uh, abodes of mankind. And the man draws. Uh, but the most radical, I think, projects um, in terms of uh, reduction of architecture was a series of uh, what I call temporal, temporal architecture. You can also call them installation. I hate the word installation. Uh, the first one was a it was called black box. That was a experimental space at the Rhode Island School of Design. It was in I think 60, 65, uh, where I uh, had a complete dark, dark room, and um, only cameras flashed every 15 minutes. And I put some objects, like some telephone books, so into that, into that space. And uh, simply recorded the whole evolution of uh, participation of that absolutely tactile, pure tactile space, and the, uh, the uh, interaction between the objects and the inhabitants. And leading to two, uh, two spaces, one in New York at the Architecture League, um, it is also interesting that was at the same time then John Hedek and Slatsky uh, had their uh, show of, uh, of uh, diamond houses. So it was quite interesting for me later when, when we became close friends, John and I, and John was one of my greatest uh, inspirations, and I think it was vice versa. Uh, it, it was interesting that I was sort of like avant-garde at that time, but he was still deeply rooted in, you know, in, uh, in constructivism and, and uh, Le Corbusier. So these were the two, the one was where I tried to create um, a voca spatial vocabulary which could not be identified by the inhabitants. So these were uh, objects, um, there were three rooms. Well, the first one were objects which were proximity devices. So when you, uh, when anybody would approach them, would create uh, different sounds. So you could start, after experiencing the different sounds, you can actually create your own space. And then you pass through a very confined uh, little cylindric room where there was a, a uh, proximity device which was rotating and you were detected. Either you walked with it, you had a permanent sound, or you were, and then you entered a completely white and cold room which signified the return. The other one at the Museum of Modern Art in Sweden was just, was, uh, this is still, there were some images from that, uh, from that space. And the uh, very opposite was uh, a space at the Museum of Modern Art in, in Stockholm, um, where there was a very small room and a, a triangular room, and I filled, I basically filled that room with, with, uh, with a solid, and then cut through that solid to make passages, uh, passages for the participants, and then the cross cuts were, were uh, 
uh, openings for electric eyes, which then detected each uh, each uh, participant, and each passage was connected with a different range of sound. From, for example, like the local sound of the city of Stockholm until the the I don't know, uh, shortwave radio for for receiving signals from uh, uh, Russia. And besides that, it was again, you know, if you recall, uh, my image of the body colliding. So it was this the kind of tactile, the tactile space. It was a total space, tactile uh, and audio and visual. And then the most, maybe the most reduced project, my hinge chair, uh, which was a, a transformation of the chair to reduction, uh, cutting it and then rehinging it and then of course we could anticipate to that latency of that cut what the possibilities of sitting would be so it was a monumentalization of sitting which then led in a way not uh, consciously but retrospectively I can see the connection of my exhibition at SIAC uh, two years ago the stargazers where uh, the only thing what that was physical uh, was the uh, the tower itself with a a chair which was uh, uh, aligned with the axis of the earth and was rotating with the earth to establish different alignments with constellation of stars but what was significant was that the stargazer was absent so it was the chair itself signified the position of the chair and the collision with the tower its own house more or less which uh, So now I'm moving more concisely to uh, to three projects, which are actually are four. One is sort of in between, uh, where I would like to uh, describe the different uh, interventions in different sites. So one, my own house in Mexico, uh, is a freestanding structure in the landscape. Uh, what that's on a hill overlooking. Uh, the Pacific and uh, my idea was to have uh, that the house would be like a mouth. I realized you know living in or visiting Mexico for many many years that what is really crucial there by you know by sort of observing indigenous uh, habitations was to have air, you have wind, to cool and to have shade to protect against the sun. So my idea was to create sort of a body, uh, the two bodies which collide, one which would be uh, metaphorically sl floating above the landscape and then the rooms, the habitation rooms would actually be embedded uh, in, the, in, the, in the ground. So uh, the part of the house would belong to the earth, part of the house would belong to the sky. So this is uh, the the house uh, uh, in the landscape overlooking the Pacific. And uh, this is the first uh, model I built. So here you can see very, very clearly what, the, what the, there is. Uh, this is like a, a little pueblo. Uh, the the uh, parts which belong to the earth together with the uh, then, uh, third element which I didn't mention is, of course, to collect water. So uh, I collect the whole water from the from the from the roof, uh, which goes into that into that uh, receptacle and then goes into a cistern, which is below uh, the terrace. And then I have a little tower in the back, which is my energy tower, which where they have the gas below the water, the water above, and then above is going to be the solar panels, which are not shown here. What was, of course. Uh, a kind of, for me, uh, almost like miraculous now after it's done that it was, that I was able to build it. Uh, first of all, there's a way, I've never anticipated in my life that I would uh, design my own house. It's very, a very strange condition when you become your own uh, sort of client in that sense. Uh, that uh, on one hand you want to 
uh, uh, of course, satisfy as any other client uh, the practical needs for living there. On the other hand, you want to de de defend the purity of architecture. So, just to give you a, a certain sense how the house is organized, there's a central, a central uh, part, which is the terrace, you more or less live outside. And uh, the larger, smaller volume on the side is the studio, the other one, the other side is the kitchen, we actually have two kitchens. One is the inside, which is the gas kitchen, the outside is the fire kitchen. And then the central part is a split level room where actually just in a way to sleep, to retreat, to have your books. And uh, so here in the section you see it's a sort of a the, the, the cistern is under the terrace and then there's the split level that so under that body that floats above the whole thing I have my my bed, my bed which is it's not a bedroom, it's like a cockpit. You can look over the landscape in all sides, and then in the in the back way and the split level you arrive is the bathroom it's, and its arrival area at the same time, and from there you go down and up. But what was then, of course, when I started uh, building it, the, the this house is in the middle of nowhere. That means there is no road to the house, so everything had to be carried uh, by hand. And, and, you know, if you, if you uh, sort of are used to technology, used to cranes and whatever other equipments, you know, you, you have available to build, uh, it was for me absolutely miraculous. You see, the, the only machine we had was this concrete mixer, which uh, was uh, driven by a gasoline motor. But it was for me already amazing how they got it to the site because it, it, in the morning it was somewhere 10 kilometers at another place and then in the late afternoon it was already on the site, very heavy. Uh, I had no clue how they did it. And then of course, uh, the, as you can see, the foundations for the house which were uh, earthquake uh, proof foundations which, which they had to carry the concrete in small buckets on their shoulders, about five, six guys. So it took a long time, but it was a celebration of the hand, it was a celebration of labor. And it was the most, I mean, after, after uh, you know, agonizing years of, of building in New York, where, you know, where you got lousy concrete, where you had, you know, con uh, 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 you know, workers who had completely lost their sense of precision. And and so it was uh, to see here that their their craftsmen there they could they could make miracles with their hand. And of course, the real challenge then was the the, the wood structure of uh, of the roof, or the, the I hate to call it the roof. It fulfills the function of the roof, but it's really a you know a, a body a, a body of space which you can inhabit with your eyes and partially also with your body. And there are some beams which are six meters long. It can deliver about four meters. And uh, there were actually two Italians who were who married some local girls there, and they they built it. And the the construction method was extremely simple. I had to use uh, technology which the guys could handle there, so uh, the brick, concrete, and wood, and uh, so I developed a a hollow a hollow con uh, a brick wall with the the uh, skeleton, the concrete skeleton inserted. So on the outside, the brick was the formwork. On the inside, the concrete is visible and it flush with the wall. So you can see already, I mean, anybody who has ever built and, and uh, to have that quality of concrete in the in, in middle of, of, of nowhere is, uh, is for me a, a miracle. I mean, that's why this house is for me, uh, just the way it was built, it was uh, really inspiring uh, for my belief what the hand can do. So this is the the so-called living area where the, the store, you open the door and then you you have there's a little ventilation slots in the studio and in the kitchen 
and then you have your framing of the Pacific Ocean from uh, from the terrace. It's also, I think, very important for me to have a certain distance to the to the ocean. I mean, I can hear the ocean uh, pounding, but visually it has a certain distance. It's not imposing. A, a so-called beautiful view, a view can be very imposing and just uh, sort of like uh, uh, is, is demanding and works against uh, uh, your own contemplation. Now the, the second project is, is uh, uh, I'm, I have become, I think, uh, famous for making the narrowest buildings in the world. The, the Austrian uh, Culture Forum was 25 feet wide and, and almost like 300 feet tall. And this is a cut, this is for the anthology film archives. The, to the left is an old courtyard building and the um, indigenous loft building on the right. And uh, Jonas Makers wanted to build a library into that gap. And this gap is exactly 11.3 feet. So I developed uh, it's a sort of th that gap. Uh, uh, I felt like the whole library is like a book, which you insert into the gap, and then on the roof you can have a screen and the projection booth for outside screening. And this was more or less the whole program. So this is the old uh, the old courthouse, which is now uh, the anthology film archives with a with a movie theater, and uh, and the uh, uh, the library consists of of catwalks uh, with an open gap which goes all the way to six stories high. So it's and the back is the wall where all the books and artifacts are. So here you really feel that insertion of the library uh, in between the two bodies of the existing buildings. And this is sort of like the principal idea, no? So you take the book. And so it's this compression that Malamé, I think, uh, described this idea of a total book where where you can read the book because all the pages touch itself, uh, themselves, so you can actually could read in all directions through the book. And this was this is a funny project. Uh, about a month ago, I was walking on my my street in New York, and. Uh, of a, a wise guy with a motorcycle stopped. He said, uh, I mean, it's actually, that's uh, uh, syndromatic for how I got my, my commissions. He said, uh, you Abraham? I said, yeah. He said, we need an idea. So I said, who is we? So he said, uh, uh, myself and my brother, we are developers. I said, well, interesting. So I said, why don't you stop by at my studio tomorrow and then show me what you have in mind. So they showed me that site and uh, the building to the left, is, that's sort of like the arched building, is an, it belongs to the uh, protected uh, landmark uh, district. Broadway is right on the other corner of, of, uh, of the, the adjacent building. And uh, the Landmark Commission, and they want to put four stories on top of the arched loft building. And the Landmark Commission, which is the most absurd thing I've ever heard, said if they build something uh, into that gap on top of this little brick building, then uh, they would let them build the four stories because you, do, you, don't, you wouldn't see it from Broadway. So the program for that structure, which I'm supposed to do, was to hide uh, what the mafia is going to build on top of the building. I thought it was hilarious. So, uh, I came up, I thought it was sort of like, uh, you know, a little guardian who, who was hiding, yeah, I think it becomes a little a guardian, yeah, a guardian is the right word. So that is the structure sitting on top of this, um, of this uh, 
so it's it's a pure it's a pure structure, self-supporting structure, with the exception of that of the red line, which is sort of like challenges its 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 diagonal challenges sort of the power of the of the parallel of the parallel walls of the adjacent buildings. That's what I thought it was sort of it fits into the into the the category of uh, of uh, intervening into a, a gap. And this, by the way, is even smaller than the anthology, is 10, ten foot eight. And this is just sort of like the, the, my the first inspiration I got for the Austrian Cultural Forum, that this again, the, the, the gap uh, when, when the, the old building was, uh, was torn down. But while, for example, the little guardian is just, you know, a shield, uh, this was a, a you know a volume with a particular function and, and the whole uh, interpretation of the zoning envelope and the and the, the layering of the falling uh, sheets was a complete uh, different uh, uh, different intent but what was interesting is about the, the the culture forum is that through its smallness but through its precision it uh, withstands. I mean, if you look at in the context of the of the cities with much larger towers, and it was ever, I was fully aware of that at the very beginning, that I never wanted to compete, of course, with the, the other towers, but rather, you know, uh, uh, reverse the whole power of gravity by having that that rising uh, stair in the back and the falling uh, uh, the falling layers on, in in front. So it was like a reversal of gravity. Now the third one is is uh, my project for China, which also was a very curious way uh, I was approached by a client, um, and I, of course, going to China the first first time I was sort of really full of anticipation with the, my memory of the uh, grandeur of uh, of the ancient architecture of Beijing. And uh, it was uh, a devastating experience. Um, that this, what you see here, this powerful image is still there, but it feels differently. It feels differently because the rest of the city, the memory of the rest of the city has been radically erased. While the site itself is uh, very prominent, you see the little red dot next to the blue. The blue is the forbidden city and the the red one is is the site, which is now that's the lot for the site. But the reality is that you see that is that is uh, the reality of Beijing now. That's uh, a, a totally anonymous site. Any memory, typologically, topologically, historically, has been erased. So I was uh, facing a very serious dilemma. That means I could not intervene into a site where I could utilize my, uh, my convictions. So I finally realized that I had to create my own site and then intervene into my own creation. So I, I mean, the, the, the client um, uh, made his money with seafood. So he wanted a theme of ocean, that the building should reflect the theme of ocean. So I record, uh, I mean this is also uh, really not true, it is retrospectively, because when, when I work I'm never aware of any influence, neither my own nor from somebody else, only later on when I start to speculate I can. So, so I realized that, that somehow uh, I, I, this is a project I did in the 70s uh, of a, uh, a structure in the canyon where the the topography uh, or the topology of the of the uh, canyon landscape would reflect itself into a a volume and erode erode almost like literally that volume, which then led this was the first sketch I made uh, for for the project in China. Client was very excited uh, first, but then he realized that he had to whatever I would do, he had to sacrifice, uh, you know, some valuable commercial space. And uh, so, in the process, we somehow 
you know, compromise, but I, you know, I, uh, I also, in terms of respecting the program and, and uh, code requirements or whatever, um, I had to, you know, modify my very first vision. So this is uh, what I <laughs> anticipated as a as my own site. You know, it's the it's a block which would contain, which was permitted by the by the zoning, uh, which would be could be utilized for the program. Is uh, uh, the core of the whole uh, program is the bath, a Chinese bath for women and men, and then from the from that bath you go into different activities and there are some autonomous restaurants on the lower floor, but it's more or less a, a, a place of, of, uh, of contemplation. I don't know if you ever have been any of you in a, in a Chinese bath, it's quite uh, funny. You go into a bath, you know, with 150 naked Chinese and then you get uh, a sort of a ridiculous looking uh, uh, uniform, sort of like a pyjama kind of them. And everybody has the same, and with that you can then enter all other activities, massages, theatre, whatever as complex as the thing can become. So <coughs> now this is my site, and I started now to intervene in that site by carving into it. I wanted to create a landscape, not to, to simulate ocean or simulate water, just the opposite. That what the power of the ocean would would perform by by hitting a rock and and eroding uh, the rock. So it's just more as a simulated sequence of of how this is a, a a sketch model which I made where I actually literally carved by hand this landscape. Uh, so it was a, a rather a very the first intervention completely emotional. And then there was this element that's very similar to the to the Austrian Cultural Institute, where where the the front volume uh, re-established the you know the the building line of the street, and uh, this one would re-establish sort of like uh, besides being a very important functional element, connecting the path now as a uh, walking uh, possibility into the into the other activities. So this is the final structure as is supposed to be built. Now, that that was the, f the first dilemma was sort of the absence of memory. Inside. The second one now was to translate that into uh, constructed architecture. So uh, I uh, also, and how to build this? You see, that's very, it's very, very actually it was very easy for me to create that image after, you know, the whole, the idea of the sketch. Uh, that was very easy. I mean, that shows my talent or whatever thing. But now to construct that, to construct it truly, no, uh, that was the real challenge. And there came in the computer as a surveying instrument. You see, and that's that is where where I think the computer is fantastic. You know, because it has can provide mechanical precision, and then it can record any point in that particular landscape. So what I did, I I. Uh, made cuts like in a in a in a CAT scan. Every foot a cut to that landscape to produce then a a surface that could be constructed and could be completely controlled. So this is just the first the first uh, notion of uh, of uh, having a grid. I mean, besides that, there is something else that is rather perverse about this project that. I realized after a while that with the sacrifice of the client, because he is losing here a tremendous amount of space, because this is a whole zone which is about three meters deep where this landscape can can uh, emerge, that I would have no control over the interior of that project. And that was, I knew that that it was would have been an impossible fight. So I said, okay, let's make let's make it very clear. I want to have total control of the outside of the building down to the to the to the doorknob of the entrance. And when you open the entrance, you're in China. And then it's your world. So the only thing what I determined for the inside was the, the module, the building module, it's one twenty two centimeters, goes to the whole building. 
which was essential for you know responding to the geometrical clarity of the of that curtain. Uh, it's in a way it's a mask. No? That's what it really is. It obscures what is inside. It makes the inside uh, mysterious. And um, and so th we determined the the column structure inside the whole structure system and. You will see then in the, 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 the back mask is completely the opposite. And so, but the, the critical uh, uh, invention was, was the, the first I thought I have, this was originally a support structure, which uh, all the elements would be cut by the computer, but put together by hand with very simple, like, you know, overlapping cuts. Uh, and then I thought I'm using uh, stainless steel mesh to, in a way, simulate the... And then I realized how uh, phony that would be. That, uh, that this, first of all, it could not be precise with that material. And uh, then it would really try to, to, to as I said, to simulate. And I didn't want to simulate anything. So this became then the real structure of, of the outside. This is, I don't know if it's hard to see. So you have, uh, which I probably show in the, but what was critical about this, that is uh, on one hand, you need the computer for the precise cuts of the, of the, the, the little elements, I mean, each of the, those uh, layers, which before, the, but then you can use uh, labor, which is extremely cheap in China, to, uh, to put the things together by hand. So it's a combination of, of high-tech technology and ancient uh, labor. I see it more clearly now. These are the different layers. This is the exact uh, uh, topology of the of that uh, of that uh, curtain wall. And this is the uh, panel structure. So these are all independent panels, which are then uh, mounted to a system of uh, horizontal supports. And this is now the actual, as it would be, it would be built. So it's almost like at the, at the edge, it's like almost like knitting. You put the things down as in knitting. And this would be the interior, like any mask. I mean, the magic uh, nature of masks is that you have an inside of the mask and the outside of the mask. And um, and uh, I think the the Greeks used actually the the negative when they made the sculpture. They had the little model of the negative of the body as a as a uh, uh, replica to to make the uh, sculptures. And this is now the others. It's like an L. This the, the front. Uh, this front uh, curtain wall is like an L, and the other L is just the opposite. It's completely opaque. It's it's metal, and I only project uh, certain important elements which I w was retaining control about their position. Uh, one is that uh, that spiral staircase which connects sort of like the massage uh, thing to the bath. Then uh, on the lower part, this, this drum is part of the a private uh, uh, private uh, restaurant, and the upper one is the theater. And those elements project themselves out to that to that very solid. So it's the, it's a dialectic confrontation, more or less, of two different kind of masks. And this, those images are more for the client, not for me. It's, but that's it's uh, accurately how it would look when it is constructed during the day and during the night. It was interesting that when I showed that to Eric the first time, he said, wow, that doesn't look like your work. And I was somehow shocked because I never, I never knew how my work looked like. You know, it, it is it's very funny because it's, uh, I thought that, that what really new meant that, you, that I had created something that was new for myself, was new within my work. And so I was never, I'm never aware how my work looks like. So it is really that very basic, I think, philosophical confrontation between occurrence and appearance. 
So I will conclude now with a project that is not mine and not of my students. That's a project that seven students and one uh, woman who was coordinating them from uh, Wolfi Brix's class in Vienna uh, in Mexico, in Oaxaca. And uh, uh, Wolf invited me for the final review of that structure. And um, uh, so I was, uh, the students invited me to write, to read, I mean, to write a text uh, for their uh, publication. And I would like to read you this text, which is not only uh, related to that project, but it's a little manifesto uh, which somehow is concluding my argument about uh, new and true. It is called Immutable Velocity. About 10 years ago, on my way to Dain Zhu, a remote temple site in the Tlacoluca Valley between the city of Oaxaca and Mitla, diagonally across from Yagul, I encountered a two-wheeled oxen-drawn cart overloaded with maize, heavy, and it appeared to me motionless. The wheels towered twice the height of the peasant petrified in his walk. In this moment, I realized that the power of the wheel does not lie in its propulsion, but in the negation of its motion, frozen in the timeless moment of its invention. So progress or newness is signified by nothing else but the attempt to reinvent with fragmentary cycles, within fragmentary cycles, the inventions of the ancients, rupturing the limits of immutable structures through the denial of motion while intensifying all space in the cessation of somatic time. Architecture time is labor time, measurable only during the process of construction, either to dissolve in dot zero of entropic space or to condense in infinity. At San Jose Pacifico, magic place of magic mushrooms, after crossing the Sierra, the mountain range stretching along the Pacific, the great plains of Oaxaca emerge, the Etla Valley to the north, the Tlacoluca Valley to the east, and the Valle Grande to the south. A landscape of unexplored spaces, rugged mountains, hills like red earthen elephants, white fields of agave, dense bamboo shielding the river banks of the Rio Atoyac. On significant vertices of the landscape, surveyed through the eyes of the astronomer, the Toltecs and Mixtecs had built their temples. The idea that students from the Academy of Applied Arts in Vienna in accepting the challenge would be capable to erect an edifice which ought to respect and dignify the spirit of this mysterious land carried my doubts from the beginning. Not impossible, I thought, but improbable. The edifice is intended to collect and distribute rainwater and providing shade for transient inhabitants. A body anchored in the bone dry earth awaiting the rain as a silent witness in the cycle of seasons. One leaves the paved road to the way back to Mihuatlan, about 30 kilometers outside the city of Oaxaca near the village of Ocatlan at the mercilessly normal setting of an electric power plant. At first a narrow path with wind-blown spiraling dust clouds, then only wheel tracks of unknown origins through steeply winding fissured hills. Finally, the eyes are torn from the landscape, capturing the view of the edifice suddenly and surprising. In the void of barren hills, sucked dry by an unrelenting sun, a bamboo cloud with counterweights or a Vulcan Kuckucksheim, according to Aristophanes, a city built by birds into the sky. The compelling image of the structure demands to pierce it with your eyes, to dissect its parts, to probe its suspended weight, to find and follow the forces of resistance in defying the terror of gravity. Crevices in the earth rain on the palm of your hands and skin stretched over the bones. 
construction, true construction, ought to question time in order to comprehend the void of space. Lines of bamboo drawn or built, hollowed grass, lightweight and sturdy, edible, edible during early growth, at its peak weapon against gravity. Halved, direct, dissected, carved, pointed, penetrated by threaded shafts, connected by nodal junctions. Suspended crossbars of concrete, resistant to compression, with the entire structure anchored to squared blocks of concrete, buried in the earth. Utmost clarity of construction carried by a rare poetic vision. This, your edifice is new, in the, in the true sense new, contrary to the shale newness of contemporary fashions in architecture. You succeeded in creating an edifice which not only celebrates resistance, but provokes it. Not to remember, but to be remembered. Zapata vive. Gracias. Is there, um, I mean, a desire to have a uh, question-answer session? Or, let's say, a dialogue is probably a better way of describing it. Now, what I also wanted maybe to add to, to this student project. Uh, when I came in here, Alexis Rojas showed me the outside on this fence the project he did for, you know, for the, for the, with his students for the homeless. And, and I, I, I think it's a wonderful project. But what I want to say is, in our time, I think there should be in any school a studio just for construction. That I think when students are faced with the problem of constructing things, then all the bullshit is cut out, all the speculations, all the fashion. And I think that is really what is so inspiring about, about the, this, this project uh, in Mexico and also the project which was done here in, in, at SIAC. Because it's, also, it's, it's not so much, I would say, how spectacular that structure is. It is what's spectacular about it, that there are you know, kids from Vienna coming to a, you know, an unknown land, working out there in total isolation for three months in that sun, eating and sleeping there, and then building with a material which was unknown to them. So that was for me the, the most incredible thing about, I mean, unfortunately, I, don't, I only made a few shots, so you don't see there are sort of concrete crosses, uh, compression members inserted into that structure. They are, they are uh, um, sort of uh, no, bolts, long bolts as compression members through the bamboo. And it's um, absolutely amazing. It was, I was, I tell you, it was a, a rare moment of, of inspiration and, and, uh, and belief actually what students can do. Could you speak a little louder? I mean. Yeah, but it's more, you see, in, in a situation also like in my own house, you're forced to accept the limits of technology. I think what is, for me, very important is not so much that you are, that you are more or less dependent on the new technology, but then all inventions in, in technology have affected your way of thinking. So when you build something out of mud, you build something different. I mean, Khan had this famous uh, dialogue with the brick, you know? So he made a completely, I mean, construction with a brick that has, has not been seen before, without challenging the archaic quality of that building material. And I think that is was really maybe was also, in a way, uh, enhancing that project that the students were forced, you know, to accept the limits of that. And then they, but to get into, I mean, three months is a very short period of time. To build that structure in three months, that's very impressive. So what I'm just saying, if those students can do it, any students can do it. As I always say, what I can do, anybody else can do. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't teach. If I would, if I would feel like I'm superior to what the, to the students, it would be that would be hilarious. Come on, guys. <laughs> Robert, maybe you should have, the faculty maybe should uh, should take the initiative here. people have uh, things on their mind and, and need to sort of express them or, or uh, you know, inquire. Um, I, I have one uh, quick question. As you know, Marion and I are also uh, trying to, uh, maybe more than you, although you seem to be getting farther, uh, embrace China and Beijing. And it, it, the, the lack of sight in Beijing, which is tragic, uh, to say the least, it also has that uh, possibility, it seems like, that you found, which is to, in a sense, sort of recite the site uh, for, the, for the structure. And, and uh, in that way, you could take that idea, maybe, and bring it into other places, whether it was Los Angeles or New York, which, which of course have sites and have the traditions in place, and yet, uh, so much of it it's let's say become banal in a, in a way or taken for granted anyway <laughs> no, I could speak without the mic yeah sure no, I think Boston deserves it um, no, I, I think the, the problem, when you, see, when you go to Beijing, when also maybe Shanghai is even more drastic, uh, where if all these new buildings, which are really symptomatic for, for architecture of our time, because they could be anywhere. You see, they could be anywhere. So it's not even a question. For me, it's always not so much the question. It's, I think the placement of an of a edifice is much more significant than maybe its architectural quality. When you when you go now, particularly in Europe, in Austria is particularly bad, where you have a political system I and mean, a power structure where a mayor of a small village is the is the highest uh, the highest power of t to decide what can be built on or, or to redesignate land. So they all corrupt. They all get paid off. And so you have this incredible cancer of little houses, you know, growing into the landscape. And then if you look, if there are any farmhouses left, any farmhouse is always located in a place which had authenticity because the farmer was very pragmatic, you know, very pragmatic about the sun, about the water, about whatever uh, elements he has to deal with. So, so by, in, in China, by this I mean, apocalyptic erasure of, of memory, then he would have to invent a new kind of architecture. No? So you have more or less a display. I mean, I was—I uh, don't know how many of you were in Venice at the, the, uh, the last Biennale. No, it was uh, fantastic for me. It was an incredible uh, 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 sort of verification of, of of the whole dilemma in, in today's architecture. So in the Arsenale, no, there were about I don't know 500 models. So asymptotes designed a system, right, of uh, sort of waves, no of waves and on the waves the models were displayed. Not only this was the most perverse thing I've ever seen, but you could have added 500 more models of so-called new projects of young architects and it wouldn't make any difference. Right? So it is the, that kind of, that everything goes and everything goes with it. That is the dilemma. There is no resistance anymore. And the only thing that I think that the, the function of, of schools of architecture is to create resistance. That the students have to learn how to resist. Otherwise, otherwise it's, it's entertainment. Otherwise, education becomes entertainment. Okay, let's go and eat. <laughs> Thank you.